Good morning and hello, welcome to COGX. I'm Tabitha Goldstorp, the co-founder of the festival. Welcome to the second and final day of the cutting edge stage. I'm so happy to be here live and online with all of you cutting edge enthusiasts. I'll be your MC today this morning and my lovely, brilliant friend, Jess Wade, Imperial College researcher, will take you through the rest of the day. Cutting Edge is the stage where we take a glimpse into the technology of tomorrow, a stage where it all really started for me and my co-founder Charlie Muirhead, a place where we were able to showcase some of the finest and boldest innovations in the tech sector from high-speed microchips, spatial computing, and truly conversational AI. I love meeting these enormously talented CTOs, scientists, technologists, and thought leaders, allowing us the inside track on some of the latest exponential technology trends shaping our society. The question we try and ask and answer here is which of today's most mind-boggling advances will dominate our business and lifestyles of tomorrow? Today we're in for a real treat. We've put together an enormously exciting package of discussions and presentations. So join us, tweet along, COGX underscore festival, use the hashtag COGX2021. We want to know what you think. What are your questions? What would you like to ask people? And check out the virtual networking area so you can actually talk to each other about these things. There's a virtual bookshop for those of you who've been really inspired by the speakers. And remember, this is your chance to ask the big questions and find out what it means for all of our future. So enjoy yourself. First up today, we turn to Asia, where the AI sector is, as we all know, truly booming. China now leads the world in annual R&D spending, and so much of broad AI innovation is emerging from the continent. Here to tell us more is Serena Chowdhury in discussion with the thought leader of a renowned author, Parag Khanna. Serena, are you there? I am indeed. Hi, Tabitha. Thank, Thank you. you Over to you. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this COGEX conversation on the cutting edge stage. Uh, as Tabitha said, my name is Serena Chowdhury. I'm an associate director here in London for the leading AI company, Dataminer. I'm also very pleased to introduce our esteemed guest joining us from Singapore, Dr. Parag Khanna, managing partner of FutureMap and a thought leader on Asia. So just before we delve into our topic, I wanted to run through a few housekeeping pointers. Just wanted to note that this session is being recorded and will later be shared. Uh, also note that the QA box for questions you may have for our guest. Uh, and additionally, you can also be part of the conversation online by tagging COGEX on social media platforms. So on to our topic, the future of AI is in Asia. Well, with a young tech smart population and an ever increasing appetite for innovation, Asia really appears to have a bright future ahead when it comes to the world of artificial intelligence, with the power to digitally transform its economies and build hyper-connected societies powered by AI for good. AI has expanded rapidly in the region over the last decade, as we all know, with countries like China, Singapore, and Japan really leading the way in AI adoption, research, and development. Countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and India are really moving towards developing national AI strategies. And artificial intelligence is rapidly becoming part of the fabric across sectors like banking, retail, and healthcare. As Tabitha said, China now leads the world in annual R&D spending, and that's at nearly $275 billion. And it is estimated that AI could add $1 trillion to the region's GDP by 2030. Of course, it's not without its challenges, and we'll be looking at that today. And in order to fully unleash its potential, the region needs to ensure those five pillars to success really are well established. And I'm talking here about infrastructure, access to data, skills and human capital, trust and regulation, as well as the ecosystem. Where data regulation, privacy and government trust are paramount and a mutually beneficial ecosystem is established for all the key stakeholders that is the general public government and corporates so how far along is asia in this journey what role will giants like alibaba baidu and google play and what of geopolitical risk in this multipolar landscape is the future of ai really in asia Without further ado, let me bring in Dr. Kana to explore this very topic and delve into some of the key areas around artificial intelligence and Asia. Parag, help me to further set the scene that I just outlined. What is the overall landscape of AI in Asia right now? 
Well, hi, Serena. So nice to join you. And thanks to you and Tabitha and the Cogex Festival. It's great to be back on the I guess, virtual stage um, uh, next year in person. But uh, I'm delighted to join you. And thanks so much for the fantastic overview. I think you've set the stage perfectly, actually. We can all break for drinks now. Uh, well, actually, it's a little early for you, I suppose. Um, but I think the best way to, to drill down is to break things up by you know the country, the major countries that are the building blocks of the AI scene, and then sectors. And of course, we should start with China, which is so not just ascendant, but dominant in many of these areas. But even within China, there are areas that more or less conform to the traditional arc or pattern of how um, a technology has evolved and AI has been in incorporated. So for example, just internet AI, when you talk about Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, where they have been training AI based on user and search data, which is exactly what uh, what the, the, um, you know, the, the fangs have also been doing in the United States. The difference being, of course, when it comes to the Chinese ecosystem, you have the super apps, right? The, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, Weibo and WeChat and so forth, where you have these, you know, consumer mobile internet super apps that are in effect sort of walled gardens in which all functions are, are uh, sort of you know in internal to those super apps. And therefore you have much more voluminous, intense and complete in many ways, the data. And uh, so that that is one difference in the way in which just internet AI has taken off in China. The other is perception AI, um, things like a Hick vision cameras, sense time, facial recognition. China has a big edge in that area and of course, because of government surveillance programs, the lack of citizen transparency and so forth, you know, they've been able to, uh, to propel that sector forward and collect enormous amounts of data as well. And this has morphed into a thriving market in the consumer realm, back going back to kind of internet AI and consumer AI, of AI influencers, right? So uh, they're very prominent already across uh, Japan and South Korea. You have these uh, AI generated influencers that uh, really, you know, in a, in a way, when we look for an explanation of it, it's the social acceptance or even embrace of technology, even if it is, um, you know, construed or if it is um, meant to be manipulative. There is naivete, in a way, about the manipulation of consumers. But in some ways, there is also a conscious rewarding of companies for being clever. Uh, and having AI be such a prominent feature in marketing. All three of those psychological variables are going on at the same time. Because remember that even though in China uh, uh, in particular, uh, consumers as citizens don't have a lot of choice, that doesn't mean they're not aware of the rapid technological advancements. In fact, they're quite aware. And you can see the spillover into tech, into entertainment, which is also obviously widely embraced. Think about the Korean company uh, Ovalmind, uh, which has developed these wearables that can read emotions that make gaming more interactive. So there is some really cutting edge stuff going on in the application of AI, but of course, some of the data it's trained on is coming from these diverse sources, some of which are not possible uh, in Western societies where there is uh, you know, more strict uh, control. Final area I'll just mention is of course, where you get into autonomous AI. Um, and this is an area where uh, in, some, in some respects, particularly logistics, for example, you can see China being um, you know, miles ahead. Uh, when you look at self-driving cars, we have Tesla and Waymo, but in China, uh, Alibaba is backing AutoX and AutoX already has a fully autonomous fleet which has no human passenger or monitor, just a remote kill switch. Um, and they've also developed an unhackable quantum satellite network. Um, the Beijing Academy of AI, BAAI, um, has just released um, a, a kit called Wudao 2.0. It's like GPT-3, but it's 10 times larger in terms of the parameters in the data set. And it has predictive capabilities like DeepMind's uh, AlphaFold. So these are some of the examples of uh, you know just how rapidly the trajectory is evolving. And again, there's the industrial, the enterprise, the autonomous, uh, the social perception, all kind of rolled into one. And you can see, of course, when we get into the politics of this, how uh, you know this can serve as, or is serving as the underpinning of many national governance initiatives in China, such as the much talked about, but though still nascent actually, social credit system. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Parag, you touched on so many different elements there, and I would like to drill into Alibaba a bit later and its sort of global influence as well, just beyond Asia. But you know, you mentioned China, and I think that's naturally where a lot of people's minds and thoughts go to when you think about AI in Asia, because you can't immediately help but think about sort of China's massive Belt and Road Initiative. Um, specifically here, I'm thinking about like the Digital Silk Road 
And of course, that extends beyond just Asia. But you know, since that digital Silk Road was introduced, um, that white paper back in 2015, it's would you say it's effectively paved the way for almost, I guess, any telecoms data related businesses by Chinese based tech companies? Like, what is that Chinese digital Silk Road going to look like? It's a very interesting question. And I think that, you know, even before the white paper, there was Alibaba. In some ways, you wouldn't have, well, without Huawei and Alibaba, you wouldn't have the execution or the capacity of China. Let's just say China Mobile and Alibaba and, uh, you know, Huawei uh, serving as that institutional or infrastructural underpinning for what has become this concept. It's similar to Belt and Road in the sense that China was doing enormous volumes of infrastructure investment um, and, you know, stronger commercial relations with countries in its periphery prior to Belt and Road being announced. So they've grafted a strategy on top of what was already happening. But it doesn't mean that therefore there's a new Cold War or something like that, because we do have to subdivide in terms of how companies are being uh, treated. So, um, you know, for example, when you look at uh, Alibaba, Alibaba, you know, is a market maker. It's created an e-commerce platform cross-border. They call it the electronic world trading platform. And Chinese, Western and indigenous companies participate, um, you know, fairly in this ecosystem. And the payment system does not require that one use China Unipay or something like that. So this is a China serving as a commercial platform or public good, private good, if you will, but with wide participation. And many Western firms are very grateful and are tripping over themselves, of course, to participate um, in these platforms so they have access to the Chinese market. And because it creates more, uh, you know, sort of uh, transparency, liquidity and efficiency in trading across borders with these societies that have not been well connected uh, to global e-commerce and so forth. So in that sense, Alibaba and what it's doing with the world trade platform is considered you know, kosher, if you will. Not so, of course, with Huawei. So that's another dimension within the same you know, sort of discussion of a digital Silk Road, which is played out very differently, where people talk about it being really a centerpiece in the so-called new Cold War, which is not something I actually believe in, but there are competitive dynamics in terms of kind of pushback against it. We've already seen in just the last couple of years, the pushback against Huawei resulting in its market share of the global 5G infrastructure market um, falling by about one third towards a half as country by country um, are being kind of uh, cajoled, you know, or coerced or compelled to uh, block Huawei or to boot it out or rip it out of its um, of its uh, telecom networks and internet uh, networks and so forth. So you have this sort of action and counter reaction. It's creating opportunities for Nokia, Ericsson, NTT and so forth. So it's a reminder that while China may have had first mover advantage in areas like, you know, uh, you know, rapid, cheap 5G deployment, it didn't invent it. It doesn't have a monopoly over it, right? It simply just had price and speed advantages. But now you have a high degree of competition. You might even say democratization of access to these technologies because of the geopolitical competition. And in the end, what you get is a competitive marketplace, which is basically what we want to have happen. But to your point, there are, again, the, the sort of dark side of the, uh, because, you know, there, there, the jury is still out, you know, even in the UK, for example, there's been a, you know, back and forth on whether or not Huawei, you know, can and should legitimately be blocked from the domestic uh, telecom infrastructure, you know, Sweden and other countries are having this debate too. But when it comes to surveillance technology, this is an area where, you know, China has, has moved ahead, it's exporting surveillance technology, we talked about, you know, again, perception AI and facial recognition cameras, as well as Huawei's sort of, you know, smart city system. It's almost, again, a sort of a, a, a one-stop toolkit, if you will, for uh, integrated sensor network can camera monitoring, tracking, and so forth that they do. But we have to remember that they're not the only ones that have this competency. You know, Oracle does as well. And then there was a news story from just a couple of weeks ago that Oracle has been trying to export this technology to other countries. Let me just make a point about this because this topic can be very ideological. So I'll, I'll you know, sort of frame it in a geopolitical way, if you spent a lot of time in countries like Serbia or Pakistan or wherever, we have to be clear that these regimes would buy this technology, whether it comes from China or Russia or America or Israel. So we cannot say or should not say that China is, um, you know, sort of in a premeditated way, 
exporting authoritarianism, right, to places where, of course, the pre-existing conditions were uh, quite conducive to authoritarianism. So we have to get our causality right here. China is operating with this marketplace. Again, we have certain constraints in our behavior. Some of our companies, some of our governments do, but not all do. So this is another area of competition. But I wouldn't necessarily use the phrase exporting authoritarianism to places that are in many ways already authoritarian. That would not be logically uh, consistent. A final point about this, though, is that smart countries don't choose sides. Smart countries don't say, I'm going to go all in with the Chinese model, you know, consequences be damned, or I'm going to go all in with the American model. And you can see that in Southeast Asia, and this helps us broaden the conversation beyond just China. If you look at the big tech stories of Southeast Asia, and for those who are not aware, this is a region of 700 uh, plus million people, a GDP that's a, similar to that of India, uh, as much foreign investment coming in as goes into China. Um, and it's not just a pawn in this new Cold War uh, as such, but rather if you look at C Group, uh, which is a you know integrated tech conglomerate, gaming, e-commerce payments, the first major tech company to list in the New York Stock Exchange, worth $127 billion right now. Grab, which is more uh, ride sharing and other e-commerce just went public via SPAC, valued at $35 billion. Gojek in Indonesia, which is merged with Tokopedia. All of these stories, involve Chinese investment, American investment, Japanese investment at the same time. And they have grown to become regional champions and giants and not be subservient to any particular master. This is extremely important when we think about the data regulation and data privacy within this. So being part of, you know, or being declared as being part of uh, China's digital Silk Road doesn't mean that you're not going to pursue data localization practices, data sovereignty, or pushing towards some kind of a GDPR style model of data governance uh, at all. And so the smart countries play all sides, take money from everyone, but make sure that they have their data integrity and data sovereignty and citizen data protection at the same time. And that's the smart way uh, that, that you know, to, to, to see how this plays out. And importantly, again, the end result is that you don't have a China dominated global internet, China dominated infrastructure, nothing of the sort, right? You again have a competitive global landscape. Yeah, I mean, you speak there, Prague, of a number of things, particularly, you know, the the model and the ecosystem. And, and you know, we've discussed and you've just spoken about sort of the Alibaba ecosystem, but also countries wanting to embrace um, or needing to embrace both sides. Um, and I say I use sides in a, a loose term here. Right. But when it comes to sort of the Asian relationship with data regulation, privacy, government trust, it is very multifaceted, right? Because you're looking at a multipolar um, ecosystem effectively. What would the ideal model be for sort of a healthy, progressive AI environment in Asia? And, and here, one of the things that I, I found quite interesting and I, I wanted to talk briefly about as well, and, and perhaps you can, um, is I thought about Singapore and sort of the impact of COVID and how COVID has really uh, required uh, the world basically to advance and embrace technology in a lot of spaces. And particularly the test and trace app in Singapore, uh, we've had previous conversations um, about the mm -hmm. fact that just uh, recently, uh, I think it was in January sometime, authorities in Singapore did come out and say that the test and trace app, which was supposed to be uh, only for a sort of COVID data, was actually used uh, by authorities for a murder case. Um, but I wanted you to just delve into a bit more as, as to the ideal model and, and what you know Asia should be thinking about when it comes to that data regulation. Right. Oh, fantastic uh, set of questions. So, I mean, the first is the broader point about regulation. And let's remember that regulation in China, which again, we, you know, we look at the political system and we see top down authoritarianism, but let's remember that the super apps thrived because Chinese regulations were favorable to innovation. Whereas you, you would have thought that incumbent Chinese banks with their massive customer base and market cap would want to quash Tencent and Weibo and so forth, but they didn't. Uh, and the reason that the government was in a way enabling uh, of this innovation is because they realized perhaps eventually that they would get far more access to data. And, and indeed that has proven to be the case. In the US, let's remember that both banks and regulators were very hesitant about digital banks and digital financial services. So this is pro-innovation regulation 
that is part of the underpinning of the Chinese story. Now let's get to your point about you know the ideal type. So you know Japan, Korea, and Singapore for sure have devoted a lot of resources publicly and have come out with very transparent guidelines around national AI programs and AI ethics frameworks. Um, the Singapore government publishes this, you know, uh, in, in uh, on the internet, and you know, there's there's, there's discussions uh, about it um, all over the newspapers and so forth. The government here in Singapore actually subsidizes training and certification programs for managers, project managers that are going to be dealing with big data around the ethical, um, you know, uh, sort of utilization of that data and so forth. In India, uh, you know, they've legislated a GDPR style, let's call it GDPR with Indian characteristics, uh, called the Privacy and Data Protection PDP law. And uh, let's remember also, you know, we haven't, we've talked about China and Southeast Asia. Let's bring in India for a moment. So remember that there too, um, uh, AI machine learning companies like Fractal, uh, for example, are thriving. And these are low cost data secure partners for large developing countries around the world. They can become the AI equivalent of, you know, Tata consultancy services and others, which are now huge global professional services and, and management consulting, um, you know, companies, because again, they're trustworthy. Your data is not being sent to Beijing or in this case, New Delhi. They're low cost, they understand their customers and so on. So let's not, this is yet another reason not think of regulation or the technology itself as being a bipolar competition because we do have to think about the role of Japan in this, the role of India and others. And now that you mentioned COVID, part of, again, of course, what makes enabling regulation possible is a high degree of citizen trust in government. And, uh, you know, as, as uh, I think, you know, as much as this, this uh, pandemic has been such a, such a horrendous you know, tragedy, one of the lessons that has come out of it that I think the world has collectively acknowledged to some degree is that some Asian countries with their blend of kind of democratic um, or even non-democratic, but technocratic and trustworthy government with a kind of you know, focus on public welfare. So whether it's China and Vietnam on the one hand, or whether it's Singapore, you know, Taiwan, South Korea, these countries have done well. And whether, again, whether they're democratic or authoritarian, there is a high degree of trust in government. And now these are the same countries where they're, all saying, where they're already saying, how can we leverage health data for digital immunity certification so people can get back to traveling? Um, because Asians, I mean, like other people too, but I think, you know, there's a pragmatism and a, and a desire for maximum convenience. And when you have that desire for convenience and an embrace of technology and a trust in government at the same time, the, that means the conditions are right, you know, to, to take, make the most of this situation. And again, uh, evolve and advance and, and, and uh, you know, technology in a way that, that uh, is going to take us to new levels, really. And of course, combined with, you know, rapid 5G deployment uh, as well and a huge investments in R&D. So this laundry list of factors that can propel AI even further for public benefit is quite long in, in Asia. And that's a good thing. Not every country is going to do it, again, in a democratic, transparent way, but you can see the willpower there across countries, irrespective of their regime type. And, you know, you brought up the case uh, of Singapore where the Trace Together app, uh, you know, data was used in a murder investigation. And again, there is a fairly high degree of transparency here, and therefore, you know, it became a, a scandal. You know, and the you know, government issued apologies and statements. It was debated in parliament. Law has been modified and so forth because people expected the data to be siloed. Or if it's not going to be siloed, you have to be transparent about that too. And I think transparency fundamentally is, is obviously the, the bedrock of uh, good governance. But the bottom line is that Asians view health security as a deep component of social security. Right. And you can see that again in the functional areas where AI is being embraced. So take, for example, the Singapore government is working with Google's uh, Verily um, around health data related to cancer markers and so forth. So this broader AI for good, whether it's healthcare, education, the number of education startups, obviously enormous. Some of them are now incorporating AI to do, uh, you know, sort of customized learning platforms. So uh, a RID, RID in South Korea, by juice in India, which is a $15 billion valuation at this point, all of them are applying AI for these kind of social purposes as well. And I think, again, you'll see all of this accelerate post pandemic. 
Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, India and, and Baiju just now, actually, because that is really quite the success story, right? India's most valuable startup um, with their latest sort of investment round. Uh, and like you said, now valued at, at around $16 billion. And there's also been some other really interesting success stories, right? So I'm also thinking of sort of Indonesia and the fact that you've had Gojek and Tokopedia also coming together as these largest um, tech startups to merge and, and create these big tech companies. I wanted to bring in a question that's just come through from David Wood, and, and this relates to Asia potentially leading the world in AI. Uh, he asks, might Asia lead the world in the development and deployment of robots in industry, homes, and healthcare? And if so, which countries in particular? It's a great question. Well, I mean, you know, if we take a sort of just a linear approach to the question, then we would say, well, which are the countries that are making the largest investments in industrial robotics, uh, you know, sort of on a per capita, per per worker basis, um, you know, and, and across industries, and you'd say, okay, well, certainly Japan, Korea, Singapore, and, uh, and Germany, you know, have been leaders, but obviously quite a few Asian countries topping the list. And therefore, that's going to evolve further. They also obviously have those initial conditions where you'd expect to see countries investing a lot more in robotic, you know, labor automation because they have an aging workforce, an aging population, shrink, uh, so shrinking therefore workforce at the same time. So they were looking at doing this even before the pandemic. If you take uh, South Korea, for example, companies like Hyundai, uh, the car company, had faced sort of a triple whammy, as I call it. First of all, their car parts were coming from Wuhan. Uh, second of all, uh, their workers who were sick, you know, couldn't go to factories uh, or, you know, if they were exposed to COVID, either way, factories were shut down. So their export productivity declined or their, their productivity declined. And then, of course, you had the global demand shock around slumping car sales. So it was a real triple whammy. So what are the, if you were a Korean executive right now, what would you be saying? You'd be saying, well, I'm going to invest a lot more in automation. Then you have Japan, where everyone knows that they've been working on, you know, fuzzy, cuddly robots for elderly care. Uh, you know, deploying um, robots in uh, hotels as check-in clerks. There's even a robotic priest, uh, a Buddhist robot AI priest who's, you know, listening to Buddhist sermons and then translating them and maybe cherry picking the best bits uh, for his um, loyal faithful in Kyoto, Japan. This kind of stuff is all happening uh, in Asia. So I expect, of course, you know, a significant deployment in this area and innovation in this area across Asia. But that is not to say it's that it's some kind of zero sum game because you can imagine that, again, it's very, very, the process, let's say the gap between invention and innovation is you know, more or less collapsed, right? And so you can imagine that in Germany and in America and elsewhere that with the right uh, commitment of resources and the kind of structuring of markets, you will see uh, these technologies spread very, very quickly um, especially when you say, you know, in areas like home, healthcare, and so forth, these will spread all over the world, even if they happen to be deployed at a larger scale or more extensively in Asia at the moment. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, just to say, if you've just joined us, uh, a warm welcome. We are discussing the future of AI in Asia. You're welcome to send through your questions um, for Parag. But moving on just a little bit, you know, we've painted sort of the picture of where the, the AI landscape is across Asia right now. I really wanted to drill down a little bit into sort of um, the need for upskilling. Because when you think about, and I thought this was quite interesting, LinkedIn's uh, sort of looked at the fastest growing job categories uh, in Southeast Asia in particular for this year. Uh, it's all around digital content, data analysts, software technology. But how do you really achieve that growth and expansion when you end up having a bit of a bottleneck in terms of demand? Um, so in terms of upskilling of the labor force, um, you know, I think it's there's a couple of dynamics that are not only domestic, uh, you know, going on here. So first of all, there is the rise of remote work and, and you know, this now becoming almost a geography free world of digital labor. And I think it's best summed up in the line by Simon Cooper from the FT in one of his columns where he said, if you can do your job anywhere, then someone anywhere can do your job. So just among humans, there is this competition for anyone who can do remote work. And a lot of companies came out pretty, and this is at the height of the pandemic when regular, when policymakers were saying, you know, the, 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 the major corporations of our Western economies need to do their part to keep workers on the payroll and to rehire more workers. A lot of them came out and said, you know what? We are now gonna look for the best person anywhere in the world 
to be our employees. And therefore, that cuts against the grain of where the policy shift is, much like, for example, the G7 tax policy as well, you know, cuts against um, what the sort of corporate interest is right now. So I just wanted to bring that in the international dimension of all of this. And of course, you know, digital platforms and technology uh, do enable us to manage global teams much better than before. And we're seeing so much innovation in that space just in the past year by necessity. Now, in terms of upskilling, um, you know, I would, I, I personally am a sort of, you know, techno optimist, if you will, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, in believing that it's not that AI, AI makes some kinds of work redundant, but it doesn't mean that humans become worthless. There's a lot of things and in, in your, in the previous question that David asked, identified them, uh, areas of labor, both skilled and semi-skilled, where there is significant shortage and humans still do those things. Humans teach each other, humans care for each other in the healthcare system, elderly care. Um, some of the fastest growing categories of employment that involve uh, you know, physiotherapy or some aspects of the construction industry and so forth, um, you know, are not automated. So when you think about, uh, you know, we need to have a lot more public policy intervention to try to either raise wages in these areas, um, you know, steer people geographically into the correct geographies of demand. And also, of course, think about uh, AI as a training tool, because more and more people should be able to afford digital access to content, to knowledge, to skills, and to be able to do perhaps automated AI driven modules to build their skills um, to prepare for the next stage of employment. And I think we haven't done nearly enough in this area. And that's why I'm not surprised that whether it is in Europe or the United States, educational reform, not just the cost of education, but the mode of education and how we can use technology a lot better, especially as everyone gets used to, you know, some degree of uh, online learning and applying that in the lifelong context. So, you know, online learning, not just because, you know, your kids are stuck at home during the pandemic, but lifelong digital learning and having low cost access to that content and then using AI to, to curate it, I think is, you know, obviously one of the biggest, uh, you know, still barely tapped markets in the world. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned the pandemic and I, I feel like this is absolutely the right time for us to delve in a little bit more because the pandemic's really shaped government, corporate, public views, um, particularly on, on AI and data. What, what are your thoughts as to how that is unfolding in Asia? Because there's a lot of conversations obviously happening in, in the West, um, so to speak, with regards to, you know, vaccination, but also uh, an upskill in terms of working from home, embracing data, the new normal, as people say. Um, but we'd love to know how you see this landscape unfolding in Asia. Well, you know, corporate culture is very different around the world. So the expectations of, you know, return to office and FaceTime and this kind of stuff are obviously far higher in, uh, you know, conservative societies like Japan and uh, Korea and to, to a large degree China as well. Um, so I think that, you know, things will play out differently, whereas we can confidently say for Western societies that the share of the workforce that is going to go remote, um, you know, half time to full time is going to rise from, you know, say 14 percent to 40 percent. You know, you can see these numbers and read these numbers in the media and, and you know, kind of. Uh, advisory firms are making these projections you can't actually say that about an asian country yet because again you know the, the hierarchical nature of governance uh in the corporate political domains makes that highly highly unlikely so i wouldn't jump to conclusions is there the technological capacity to do that yes are these economies that like western societies are largely service sector dominated yes is the percentage of workers who could work remotely again could um, you know, relatively similar? Yes. But are they going to do it? Not quite sure yet, right? So I think that that culture matters a lot when it comes to that. But then on your point about health, just to reinforce what, what you and I both said before, um, you know, these are health first kinds of societies, right? It has a lot to do with, I mean, many factors, the fact that they're aging, of course, filial piety and, you know, multi-generational family structures, having a lot of medical doctors being in politics, which is the case in, in Singapore and other countries as well. All of that plays a role in that. So I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of prioritization of the application of whatever technologies to health, whether it is healthcare and vaccination tracking behavior and so forth. I think that's that that proclivity 
cultural and historical, of course, informed by having had the SARS epidemic here in 2003. Um, all of that is just reinforced by what this region has just experienced, what the world has just experienced. Yeah. Prague, I've just had uh, two more questions come through. So the first one is from Vota Slichter, uh, who says, do you have any best practices on managing foreign AI tech in your company? Uh, and I'll come into the second one too, which comes from Enrico Masset. How do GDPR rules affect the Asian AI rise and how could Europe really align and compete? No, it's very interesting. And we are seeing a lot more European companies coming to this region. You know, obviously e-commerce, uh, payments, uh, things in the sort of the Klarna, Revolut, mobile banking, afterpay type of market where credit scoring and, uh, you know, it's sort of, you know, instant credit and these kinds of things. Uh, this is the kind of, these are the kinds of sectors where Vietnam and Indonesia and Thailand are just enormous markets, the Philippines, because you're talking about populations anywhere between 100 and 200 million people, where you have a lot of unbanked people, um, you have your rapid growth in internet penetration. The year-on-year -year growth, by the way, in e-commerce transactions in, a, in an ASEAN country, a Southeast Asian country, is anywhere from 30 to 50 percent growth. Uh, every single year, right? So it's 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 quite frankly staggering. And GDPR plays a role there because as uh, European Union and I, uh, you know, many diplomats here who work on this, you know, are nudging ASEAN countries to collectively push for an ASEAN equivalent of GDPR. That's going to a defragment the market because right now you have differential data regulation or data localization policies some apply their national security considerations to every sector others say it's just financial data others say just health data but if you can get this again this geographic area of 700 million people and then plus india with its uh, pdp and so forth to have similar laws, that's obviously going to favor um, those those uh, companies, you know, such as the Europeans, where where it is in fact their standard. So that's going to help uh, Europeans to compete more actively here. And I do think that uh, ASEAN countries are pragmatically moving that direction because, again, each of them individually is relatively small, whereas collectively it's huge. So whether uh, it's you know it, on the basis of just wanting to demonstrate that you have a transparent high standard policy to attract that foreign investment um, and those companies and their marketing departments and their kind of commercial representation and data centers, um, or whether it's to be a, a hub um, uh, for the entire region, you do have to comply upwards, right, as it's known. So I think that that is something that's going to uh, transpire. That's going to be a smart move for this region to make, and it's basically a pro-European tilt, if you will. That said, American tech has been rolling with the punches very well. Let's remember that part of the reason that um, you know uh, 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 Facebook and Amazon and, and Apple and Google and others have been so successful in Southeast Asia is because they haven't had a huge presence in China, at least you know, the social media ones haven't. And therefore they've, they've focused on South and Southeast Asia, especially think about how India is the largest market of users for many social media apps and so forth. So they've been you know, maybe able to roll with the punches and adjust their policies to that national level. But ideally, of course, if it is, uh, if there it is harmonized, it's it makes it a more competitive uh, landscape, and uh, so that that kind of answers both questions at the same time. Yeah, great, thanks, Prague. I know we're we're coming soon to time, but of course, it is really important. We're speaking uh, at Cogex, which is taking place in in London, as as well as this sort of hybrid model that we're part of. I really have to ask about uh, the UK and Asia uh, when it comes to AI and I guess in a post Brexit world. And that also ties into one other question that came through and, and that is that are European AI companies bound to come in third place behind Asian and American ones? Well, I think, you know, not necessarily, but uh, you know, the, the thing is that the, the scale of expansion that um, that, that the U.S., that the sort of capital base of American tech companies has enabled is, is obviously staggering. And there is that huge, you know, built-in advantage, first mover advantage and so forth. But, um, you know, that said, in all likelihood, when it comes to the growth in trade between regions of the world, Europe and Asia trade a lot more with each other than Asia trades with the United States. And it's very likely that that Eurasian kind of access is going to grow a lot faster. So it's not to say that there aren't large advantages for Europe, but that your, your bigger question about Western interests 
um, in Asia, both in technology and geopolitically, I think is really a very significant one. And it's perfectly time to discuss this because we have the G7 meeting that's just been going on right now. And if you look at what the G7 has come up with, it's the uh, B3W, right? This was the acronym all over the news yesterday, Build a Back Better World. And that's obviously a very conscious play on Belt and Road, right? So B3W is now meant to be the Western answer to Belt and Road. And what did they emphasize in their declaration, in their communique? It's certainly infrastructure finance, uh, which is, again, the hard uh, side of it. But then it's the technology, right? So continuing to push back against Huawei, uh, having Western firms in the telecom market be, be stronger, looking at um, what is called these, these coalitions, D10 or T10, which stands for, um, again, advanced, technologically advanced democracies, which means, again, the UK and the US and Canada and France and Germany, but also the Asian ones like Japan and Korea and India forming a coalition to ensure that Chinese technology doesn't dominate some of these critical areas, um, you know, whether it is the technology marketplace in those countries or international supply chains or e-commerce platforms and so forth. So I do think that we are seeing in the last one or two years, the beginnings of a sustained and vigorous Western push or push back, if you will, um, not just against China, but more or less to compete for these underserved markets. Because again, this is kind of why Belt and Road exists in the first place is because a lot of countries, that most pop some of the most populous countries in the world are these post-colonial societies where you have huge populations and very poor infrastructure. And it's a long, long road ahead to see who wins in that marketplace. And so I think, um, you know, in the spirit of the question, there's, um, you know, a huge potential for Western companies and governments to step up. But whereas Asian countries have really strong export credit policies and the government you know, backs companies very strongly, um, that's not as strong in the West. Again, you know, yes, European countries do have a, a, you know, large export credit agencies, but they're not as aggressive um, as the Koreans, Japanese, or, or Chinese. But again, the opportunity is a permanent one. If we look ahead the next three years, five years, 10 years, because the difference between having this con our conversation now and three or four years ago is that there's basically a permanent suspicion of China. And you know that may seem like a controversial statement, um, but it's just a geopolitical or a psychological fact. And it wasn't really the case five years ago. Uh, and in fact, four, four, three or four years ago, people were still taking for granted that Belt and Road as China's grand strategy, both on the hard infrastructure and the digital Belt and Road side, was going to be the new global standard and tilt the world towards um, you know, Chinese models of everything. That's not the way you know, we're looking at it today. Instead, again, we're seeing the sustained Western response and, and pushback. So again, it all comes back to you know, what I was describing earlier is the geopolitical marketplace, a more democratized, but not democratic, but a more competitive landscape among technology vendors. And it really is up to um, you know, Western firms to step up, whether they are American or whether they are European. And a final thought on this is that, again, it should focus on the needs of the citizens of these societies. So, you know, customer first, citizen first. Uh, one example that springs to mind is what Imperial College uh, London has done actually in, in the med tech area. I think it's called Third Eye. And, you know, Third Eye is this early warning system around organ failure. Um, so, you know, thinking about the medical needs from the bottom up of these societies, um, you know, and addressing those needs with the right technology matching, again, subsidies or, or JVs and partnerships is uh, is the right way to go to sort of, you know, win friends and influence people, you know, how to win allies and influence societies. Uh, the, the, there is no predetermined winner in that race. As far as I'm concerned, that race has really just only begun. Yeah. We are almost at time, 30 seconds, very quickly, Prague. Final question from Fada Jassim. Any two or three Asian tech startups that you might want to mention that we should be keeping an eye on in the future, and particularly those that may have a global impact? Oh, um, one that comes to mind is actually a Singaporean one, uh, um, uh, PatSnap, right? So PatSnap is, uh, uses uh, um, sort of natural language processing, machine learning to, to curate patent searches 
And it, uh, its original investors were SoftBank and Tencent. So again, Japan and China. So it's actually a really interesting story there, but Singapore based. And this is actually going to bring a lot more uh, kind of, you know, uh, speed and efficiency and transparency to this whole marketplace around um, understanding that the patent market and what technologies are evolving where and so forth. Because the thing is with patents, of course, when you do make a patent application and it's recognized and filed, there is a lot of transparency around what the technology is and what it does. So I think that's just you know one good example of uh, of, of a sort of you know AI driven uh, sort of startup that's uh, that's making waves. Great. We'll leave it there uh, with all eyes on on PatSnap in the future. Parag, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Looking forward to having another conversation in say another five years time where we can explore where it <laughs> heads to then. Um, but thank you so much. Um, it's been absolutely. Thank you. And I'm going to pass uh, us back to Tabitha. Thank you both so much. I learned so much about the geo geopolitical marketplace. Um, thank you. It was especially interesting for me to hear how China faces the same challenges as the UK when upskilling the workforce. And I do agree with you, Prague, uh, that suggestion around AI in education, in leveling the paying field, being the most untapped area of investment um, was definitely something I think about a lot. And of course, I will be using the phrase citizen first now for the rest of the festival. So um, <laughs> thank you both. And now I'm going to actually hand over to Jess Wade, your MC for the rest of the morning. And she will introduce you to the incredible NHS team at about 11 o'clock. So before then, just want to say goodbye to everyone and remind you to head over to explore the virtual expo booths, meet people in the networking area, share the um, videos on your favorite social media platform and enjoy yourself. See you all soon. Bye bye.